All right. Hey, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Happy Tuesday. Um, today, we are joined by uh, another Chef Success client and friend who has been with us since 2019. Um, he's going to be sharing his journey from you know being in the police force, um, dealing with his own um, personal issues around mental health, but also the success that he's now gained, gained in business. So um, welcome to the show, Gareth Dickinson. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks, Alex. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you, mate. Very well. Good. So um, what I want to start off by talking about is your journey in the police, first of all. Um, how old was you when you first joined and um, what were your reasons for joining? So I joined when I was about, well, I first joined about 2009, so I'd have been 22. And I joined as a special constable uh, in, in Derbyshire Police. And because uh, that's where I'm from. And I'd always wanted to join. I'd always wanted to be in the police since I was about... 15. Mm -hmm. uh, so I saw everything that I did growing up, uh, you know, in terms of like education and experiences as gearing me towards joining the police. Um, and 2009 ish was there wasn't a lot of recruitment. So uh, because there was a <laughs> what we now call austerity, uh, mm -hmm. I just I just kicked in um, and there was no recruitment anywhere. And I was I was looking at all the forces Um even uh nuclear police british transport police um because i wanted to get in i'd always wanted to join the police i had a family that had been uh in the police and it was kind of uh, brought up a little bit around the stories that they had and the things that they were doing and just that you know what they say is no two days are the same yeah. and i absolutely believed it and I joined as a special constable and um yeah it was pretty much every spare moment I would turn on uh, and turn and turn in for, for a tour of duty um and uh then a few years later I uh I, I moved up sticks uh I'd met I met my now partner she uh, she got a job uh down south and I thought I wonder if the police are doing anything in uh in Thames Valley and they were recruiting Okay. So uh, I joined there um, and uh, started off really enjoying it. Uh, yeah. in, in Thames Valley, I worked in uh, I worked in Windsor, Maidenhead, uh, Slough. So very different uh, communities um, and different types of demands for service. Uh, yeah, and I really enjoyed it. You know, it's like any anything is we're testing times. Um, things we're just thinking. I'm not quite sure if if I know what I'm doing with this type of incident or this type of person. Um, but every there was a nice mix of service as well mm. uh, on the team. So uh, there was quite a few of us who were probationers. There was quite a few who were middle level. There was those that had done other things. So it was really those sort of more senior officers, you like, were a nice steady hand. Yeah. Uh, able to calm things down and just really guide you in terms of uh, of being in the job um and then we wanted to move back home and um we transferred uh, around 2016 ish um to south yorkshire uh and i worked in a very busy busy area of, of sheffield uh so a bit of city policing and a bit of um uh, suburban policing in, in quite a impoverished community uh, mm -hmm. quite disenfranchised from the police uh, yeah. and really getting involved so again very very different types of demands um uh yeah and quite um yeah very very busy should we say very demanding um those that wouldn't really want to talk to the police and um and, and those that wanted absolutely everything more than what we could offer mm -hmm. um and I, I did quite a lot. Of, I got quite a lot of skills, a lot of uplift uh, at South Yorkshire. So I did, you know, like CBRN training. So that's chemical incident response. I did public order. Um, I got pursuit driving, method of entry. So it was really kind of, um, if you wanted the skill, they were happy to justify putting you on it. Yeah. Uh, and then I went and did a, uh, I came from the response side of things. And I went and did a two year stint uh, as um, uh, as like a neighborhood officer working working at the universities in Sheffield. Mm -hmm. So it was a privately paid for role uh, and it was very different. You, you know, it was it wasn't that quick, quick, quick demand for service. This was more building long term parts of minds type policing. 
um, working with international students quite a lot. So those that weren't English speaking had a different thought process around the police um, and giving, giving them the access to policing and criminal justice, if you like, um, that they may not be as accustomed to being able to access if it was just if it was just a response officer going to an incident. So um uh and then that was really around that 2018, 2019 time when I really started thinking, I'm not sure if I like the job anymore. Mm. What was it? What was the what was the so at that time, 18, 19, uh, 2018, 19, yeah. how long was you in the force at that point? So I'd been, if you include being a special it was around the night nine year mark 2018 okay. to join Same. the specials at, at 2009 um so being in this sort of police family yep. for about nine nearly ten years at that point okay and what was it that started to make you think mm, i don't know if i like this anymore what was it you know what was going on was there a certain incident or so it was, it was a combination of incidents really so um i noticed there was a lack of a lack of time to really get things done uh i remember one in one in particular shift i'd, I'd done a week or almost a set of felt like i was just doing cell watches um well, in, custody, in custody in custody just felt yeah. like i'm you know glorified porter yeah. um in a way and um i was told one shift now you're away from that and you know get your paperwork done because you've got you know court files building up brilliant cheers mm -hmm. And then as soon as I'm doing, getting to doing that, and I've got three files, mm. I try to do a bit of, a bit of, a bit of, mm. uh, Sergeant then asks, uh, I need you to do something else. Right. Um, so you've already got this workload. Yeah. And your Sergeant yeah. gives you more. Yeah. Yeah. And my, you know, my response was, well, I'm sorry, Sarge, but there's eight other cops that are sat around just having idle chit chat. Why? And it's like you give a busy person a job to do. You can already see I'm, you know, I've got my, my I've got my head in these jobs. Yeah. But you told me to get done, now you give me something else. Yeah. Um how did he so, respond to that? How did I respond to that? How did he respond to that when you um said they basically said, um, you're moaning for the sake of moaning. Mm. And I was like, I'm only doing what you've asked me to do. How did that make you feel? That like shit. Mm. It's just like I'm not I'm not just being busy with papers for the sake of you know of for the sake of looking busy. I'm trying to get these things done. You know, um I've gone out doing my job mm. and this is I'm trying to deal with the, the result of it, which is getting people in, you know, in front of the court. Yeah. And you know, you're now giving me something else when we've got another team when there's a team of <laughs> other cops sat on the other side of the tables that I am mm. that are talking about random rubbish yeah um and it made me feel yeah it made me feel crap um yeah. it's like well am i not valued am i being given a am i being given a harder time mm -hmm. um for whatever reason I, I don't know um uh and they were my sort of direct line manager as well so right. when it came to like pdrs and stuff like that um uh, yeah they weren't a very good manager did that did that, that happen on it? So obviously that was one of the first instances where you started thinking about, you know, is the job for me anymore kind of thing. But were yeah. there any other instances where you thought, mm, something's not right here? Yeah. Um the it felt like the, the job was becoming very quick to pin things on you. Right. What what in, in terms of um, you know, um things you're doing wrong with your workload or things you're doing out in the public? Um, yeah, out, out in the public, you know, right. the perception and things like that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, um, it is really important. It, it is. And I very rarely got, uh, you know, complaints. I was, I was lucky in that respect. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, yeah, what I noticed was that there was a lack of team, team spirit. So very much be so say for example, you know, you you've done that arrest at you know the night shift at four or five o'clock in the morning, you know you're going to be off late anyway. Mm. But there was no one going, Oh yeah, we'll help you start that bit off, we'll get this bit, we'll get that bit, which right. we'd done in my previous teams. Yeah. Um, it was now just people putting their heads down and you know, so it was very much you left to it. Yeah. You left to it. 
Uh, and I noticed I was getting off late from work more and more. Um, and yeah, when you were obviously uh, asking about it, you know, what you, you know, and it'd be things like the, doing the, the last cell watch or the scene watch or things like that. You know, if you've been, if you've been taken off it, you want that person to come to you. And it was like, you know, people coming up via McDonald's and Costa and things like that. And it's like, yeah. you know, so it was, it was thing, it was things like that that were beginning to, you know, great thing. Yeah. Uh, on me. And that's why I want, that's why I wanted to make a, the change to go and do a different type of, of policing. So it was more, it was more control and it was more sort of friendly hours, if you like. Yeah. Um, uh, but then I noticed we were going to more and more, um, course of service that weren't police related mm. just because there was no one else to fill that gap. Right. And it, it just felt like I'm not equipped enough mm. to deal with these things when it should be a medical type of thing, or it should be a social services type thing. And then because we're there, we can't leave, you yeah. know, we're sticking plaster with a bandage where, you know, and we're, we're the, with the operation, the surgery and the physio and everything put into one. Um, yeah. And it would just be, well, that, you know, it's, the, the conversation was, well, it's just the way, it's just the way it is. Mm. And, well, does it have to be? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, they're, they're common things that, you know, come up quite a lot. And I can imagine it's very frustrating, mm. especially when you sign up to be a police officer and obviously you're not really feeling like a police officer because you're doing, you know, yeah. not policing yeah. jobs, right? Uh, and it, it it very much felt like, cause, and then I went back to to response, and it, in that two years, it, it completely changed. Um, in what way? You know, it, like teams are smaller. Right, got you. Okay. Uh, teams are smaller, so you were doing more, we were covering more distance. Um, we were, you know, the, I remember starting and the workload maybe being about five or six jobs. Mm. To deal with and now you know the, the the list was going like two or three pages on your workload and it's like no matter how much i deal with this i'm never going to get through it yeah I'm you're always like feel like you're falling behind almost almost yeah, yeah. As, as soon as you come on you're always behind and yeah. i was noticing you know young in service bobbies who were coming in on rest days uh who were taking leave to get work done mm. as well. and i just thought that is that's that's not the way to be yeah the way to be that's come up quite a lot i think a lot of when i was in the job a lot of people were saying like they would take their their work like it was blackberries they used to have used to take that home quite a bit and, yeah uh, yeah they'd, they'd be on it at the dinner table and the missus is kicking off and yeah, yeah it's not a good, yeah. good, not a good and thing I, I i did a little bit of that uh when i did the neighborhood role because it was a t it was a team of three mm. so it was me one other and another so <laughs> if we weren't talking about things away from from work kind of that was our way of doing a handover right because sometimes we didn't always bounce onto bounce onto each other yeah. um and then kind of from there i noticed that i just was not enjoying it i felt like i just felt permanently tired mm. uh permanently stressed as well i was always thinking mm. about the job yeah but not in a not in a good way it was like Right. How many days? Oh, I've got I've got four rest days. Right. What can I what can I do? And all right, I've got three rest days now. I've got two rest days. Oh, I'm back in work tomorrow. And then it would be not sleeping, which I know is a common thing from for, for a lot of bobbies on shifts, you know, going back to that first day shift after a set of days off. Um, but I just felt in like perpetual jet lag and I didn't feel like I was really present in anything. Just just like um I'm just at home and I'm a shell. Was this the first time, and um, probably you wasn't aware at the time when you was having this like jet lag feeling and tiredness and this overthinking and the stress, but were they looking back the first signs of your mental health being affected? Absolutely. Absolutely. If I was to look back now and kind of look down upon me from a bird's eye view, yeah. yeah, it would be a completely different Gareth to what it was, you know, 2009 to sort of 2016, you right. know, where I was doing, you know, I was I, I was doing other things. I was in, you know, I was in sports groups and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and I just kept saying, oh, it's because it's the shifts. It's just so busy. It's because of the shifts. Mm. Um, but I wasn't doing 
anything else. Yeah. And um, I just thought, <clears throat> um, I, I need to do something else. Okay. What, what is it I can do? Because I saw myself as just staying in a job. Yeah. Um, I'm doing, you know, doing the, the 30, 35, um, and then, yeah, just a, a, just a career in the police. Um, I have a thought, thought, it's got to be, it's got to be something else I can do. I'm not enjoying it. And I was, fe- I felt horrible, mm. you know, like I, I wasn't, I didn't want to go out. I didn't want to do things. I just thought I need to be, I need to be fresh as I can for work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but- and then it was doing more and more overtime as well. Right. So that kind of compounded it. When, oh, yeah. Yeah. With regards to your mental health and, and you're very open about mental health, which is, which is, which is great. Mm. Um, obviously the depression side of things and, and is it PTSD as well? Yeah. Yeah. When, when did you like for first know, I know you talked about the, the jet being feeling jet lagged and tired and overthinking. When was the first time you thought, hang on, this is might be more serious than it is. Cause a lot of people, you yeah. know, will brush off the tiredness or like you said, you know, you've got shifts. It's just that. <laughs> but when did you first know that? Hang on. I might, be having depression here or something else such as PTSD? When did you first kind of click onto that fact? Um, I would say it was in the last 12 to 18 months yep. that I actually served uh, in the police. Um, I, I'd, I'd, I'd lost a lot of patients. Right. With with because colleagues, friends, family. With, 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 with everything. Yeah. With, with everything. Um, I was, you know, very you know, very quick to become irritable. Mm. So the slightest noise or, you know, something that was repetitive yeah. would just would, would just go, I, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. You know, just turn that thing off. Or why do you keep talking about this in that way? Um, <clears throat> um it, it, you know, yeah, irritable with with colleagues or not listening to them. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. that's not you, right? That's your not your character. So no, no, honestly, it's not no. like you. You're thinking something no. else is here. Uh, yeah, so, something else. And um, I went. I ended up having a month where I went to three uh, infant deaths. Right. Um, and yes, you get you get what they call trim, which is trauma incident management, uh, which is okay, you know. And you could talk kind of like how you're doing now. He's thinking, you know the process is horrible with it and and everything like that um and then what was the real <laughs> straw that broke the camel's back for me was i uh, my last active shift if you like i'd arrested uh, a, a drink driver <laughs> and i was single crewed which mm-hmm. wasn't not uncommon um but there's a lot of processes to deal with with a, with a drink driver and uh, I get to custody and the custody sergeant looks through me just like, oh, you've really interrupted my Saturday. Wow. Um, and, they were, yeah, you know, they've gone through the booking, booking in process and they were just giving me the, the right royal inquisition. Mm. You know, um, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you, have you, can, you know, have you thought about, you know, did you, did you think about taking them to hospital? All these types of things. Yeah, and uh, and I ended up saying, look, either either authorize it or don't. Right. I said, I don't get why you're, you know, giving me such a hard time with a drink driver. Yeah. I've told you, I don't know how many times that I'm single crude. There's only so much that I can do. Yeah. Um. And I said, authorize it or don't. I don't get why you're being so, you know, so so arsy yeah. about it um and with a little bit of back and forth yeah um and what it was i had interrupted them making their phone call for their takeaway curry because they were half an hour due to go off jesus christ and uh it was changeover and custody shifts as well Mm -hmm. i'd interrupted the handover period uh and new set of custody sergeant comes on and i knew this custody sergeant um, because uh, we've done quite a lot of like PSUs together and stuff like that, so I knew him away from the custody desk. Um, and he was like, "Don't know what the problem was there." Da 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 da. Five minutes later, in yeah. did the you know the proper breathalyzer thing and everything like that. 
And I left, I went out from there feeling just really deflated. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, like, yeah, I think I'm now, I think I'm now done. I was, yeah, I went home. Well, I went back to, to, to work almost just really seething because that took up the whole shift yeah. then, dealing with because uh, I was left to do the handover, the evidence gathering, the statements, yeah. everything. Um, and it didn't, they didn't blow that much over. And um, the, uh, uh, the sergeant for the next shift <laughs> contacted me and said, oh, it's, it's going to look like it's, you, you've you got to stay on to deal with it. And I went, no, mm. that's the whole point of the handover process. Well, I haven't really got anyone on nights I can spare. That's just like, Sergeant, <laughs> nicest possible way, it's not my problem. Yeah. My my job isn't to manage the staffing. Uh, or could you could you ask anyone to, you know, from your team to stay on? I was like, Sarge, I'm not, I'm not a sergeant. Mm. That isn't my job. Yeah. Um, I just thought, yeah, I'd had enough. I, and I went home, <laughs> I went home really seething. And that was never, never how I'd used the bin. I've gone home tired, yeah, exhausted, but never, never like, I'm really sick of this. I, yeah. Everything, it felt like everything I did was just turning to, you know, to, to my norm. Um, I, I, yeah, and I just thought, I, I don't like it anymore. I, I don't want to be here. I don't like it. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I was due to go on a set of courses uh, on the rest days. And um, it was what really triggered it for me. Uh, and it's a it's sort of a, a word that everyone likes to use now, triggering. But what really set it off for me was when um, <laughs> it was when uh, Donald Trump had lost his second a second election and we had, oh, yeah. we had the Capitol Hill riots. Yep. And I remember seeing the, the police officers there just getting, you know, battered basically. Mm -hmm. And that's what set me off. Wow. Because of what I'd seen previously, yeah. you know, through officers, being, through myself being assaulted, you know, through the course of my duties. And I just remember just, yeah, and I'll be really open and honest. I broke down and was crying for about half an hour. Bless you, mate. Um, uh, yeah there's no shame in that at all you know no, 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 by, by the way for everyone listening I, if they listen to podcasts i've had my own issues when i was younger and yeah, i cried too mm. um so this is going on in the police you <laughs> obviously have had experience in issues tiredness jet lag um mm. quick to you know impatience and you know being quick to anger now which is not like you it's not your characteristic mm -hmm. Then you have an issue in custody and that gets compounded on top. And then, of course, you go to these, you know, the Donald Trump thing. And basically mm. you see your colleagues being battered and that kind of yeah. triggers things as well. And obviously with the infants, yeah. seeing the infants, at what point do you then go, I need help? Do you speak? Did you speak to your partner? Did you speak mm. to colleagues or family? Yeah. When and you told them, you know, I need I help. I just I I remember being really open with my partner and saying I just don't feel right. Um, and I never felt like I was gonna I was gonna do anything harmful to me or to anyone else. Yeah. But I just felt like vanishing. Mm. And just you know just beat away you know and things like that. Yeah. Um, and I was really open with uh with my parents as well um and um yeah so um and what what i did i was quite proactive with it you know i, I spoke with work very quickly when i was open and honest and um i I'd had, a, had a different sergeant at this point and yeah he he got it okay. he just said right he said you're off yeah so you're off um and he put the referrals through i i i, I sorted out my own counselor because i knew waiting on on work and nhs would be a long time yeah there would be that's a common thing yeah 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 so i managed to find a counselor who almost had a bit of a specialism in dealing with those that served in the served in services mm. so armed forces police fire um so we ended, uh, yeah, I had 
probably five months of uh, of talking sessions mm-hmm. with this council. And this was during COVID yep. as well. So it was over Zoom. Yeah. So really different experience. And um, um and she asked me what you know what does it feel like kind of like how you how you've just done um and what you know what would you put it down to and she asked me to do homework okay and one of the things was go th- she said in the in the years you've you, you've been in try and list down as as chronologically as possible all the traumatic things you've been to mm. and it ended up being four or five pages wow and this was just bullet points. This wasn't big paragraphs either. Yeah. And I don't mean traumatic in terms of going to a, a shoplifter, um, you know, a, 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 a bit of a car bump or anything like that. This was, you know, house fires where bodies had been pulled out. It was seeing other officers injured um, and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> yeah, that was, um, yeah, they took me like four or five pages. And... The following session from there, we went through almost like a scoring assessment yeah. to to drop it in line with is it depression, is it is it compound, is it other things, and everything was ticking towards PTSD. Right, and and it's funny. So, you know, we, we there's a lot of people in the police who are, who who have PTSD, and I think there's a lot of people who don't realise they have it either until mm. they get obviously diagnosed. Do you you know? Do you feel like that can happen at a first incident? So when people see something for the first time traumatic, or do you feel like it it is over the years, it's compounded of seeing it again and again and again? Because what you guys see isn't normal. Like in your yeah. world, in the police world, that's your normal. But yeah. the the human body, you know, the, the society don't really see that kind of thing. No, they don't. And for, for me, it was the compound. Yeah going to the same things over and over and over and over, experiencing the same things over and over and over and over. Um, And there being no valve to, you know, to say to anyone until you're at that real peak of crisis of going, I need to do something different Mm. for a little bit. Mm. Uh, And, and, you, you know, and I've got to understand more around, how it can manifest and it can be just one mm. profound incident yeah um but you know those that serve police fire ambulance forces yeah you're right we, we see more than what the normal person does and a, and a normal person's lifetime they may they may average be experience, exposed to three to five mm. traumatic incidents uh i think in the the length of of service it, it, it's somewhere in the region between three and four hundred Jesus, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that is going to take uh, a toll, whether it's knowingly mm. um, or, or or unknowingly. Wow. And with where you are, I mean, we'll go into your, you know, the the happier things in a second with yeah. what you're in yeah. business. But do you do you, you know you you you've been out of the job now. You, you've built your successful business again. We'll get into that. But do you feel? Look, I, I know you feel better now, but do you still have those thoughts come up to do with PTSD and yeah. depression? Yeah. 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 Uh, <clears throat> yeah there's, there's, you know, and I'm on, I'm on medication and again, I'm open about it. Um, uh, so I have sertraline and I have the, I have the top amount that you're able to have uh, yeah. per day. Um, and anyone that's, that's on it, um, will know what it's like if you if you end up having a day or two where you go without it um and sometimes yeah i do have those moments where um i just want everything to stop mm. a day or two just so i can hear just so i can hear myself again yeah because i know when i get busy 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 and i like being busy yeah. um but i know when i've got too when it's got to too much because I'm a bit fidgety. I don't rest that well. Um, and I have, you know, I have like ongoing headaches and things like that. So, uh, and I feel low in terms of energy. Mm. Um, so yeah, I still do have it, but not as bad as, as, as what it was. Cause when I was, uh, initially off and discovering what it was, <laughs> um, I could still go out, but, yeah. 
um, I couldn't go into supermarkets because I couldn't deal with tannoys mm. and the, the clattering of the trolleys, the, yeah. that that metal on metal mm. sound. Um, car horns, mm. you know, so someone was beeping. I'm looking to jump over the next wall um, because it was just that, right, something's going to happen mm. uh, type incident. I didn't like getting phone calls unexpectedly. Mm. <clears throat> um, and I remember, you know, things like, because we were renting our house out at at, one, at the same time as well. Yeah. Um. So if the estate agents called from an unknown number, uh, or it was an unexpected phone call, I said, "If you look at me booked in, mm. have you given me pre warning?" Because I said, I, I, you know, I can't. I just said, "Look, I'm busy." I, I didn't want them knowing, but I said, "I'm busy. You, you need to just tell me beforehand that you're yeah. in." Um. So things like that were just. It was a lot of management for me. Um. And yeah, it was like noises coming past the house mm. uh, as well. So, I mean, I am a lot, lot better now. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, I uh, I went, whilst I was off, I managed to get two weeks at the police treatment centre uh, in Harrogate. Yep. So if anyone does pay into their benevolent funds and their treatment centres, keep paying in, use it. Because yep. I got two weeks there <clears throat> and I wanted for nothing. I had my own room. Uh, we had talking sessions. We had well-being sessions, awareness, swimming. Um, we went on well-being walks and things like that. Um, and the people that are on the on the well-being course, I still speak with now. Yeah, that's good because because we yeah, it's not every day. Um, but there was people there that I, I thought, wow, I thought I had it bad. Yeah. There's the, um, you know, difference, like almost like tears, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like tears. And the, the biggest thing that we were taught is, look, don't compare your feelings to that of others. Yeah. Everyone's got their own point. Yeah. Um, so that's one of you know one of the biggest things that one of the therapists there said to me is, why are you doing things that aren't right for you? Mm. Mm. I just thought, yeah. Yeah, and at this point, I, I, you know, I was still within Shift Success, um, mm. and uh, the previous business idea I had wasn't really working. And I thought, with what I'm experiencing, <clears throat> I don't want to have to be kind of delivering that as a training instructor. Yeah, yeah. In this business, so that's when I thought I need to do something completely different. I um, remember, I remember the pivot. Yeah, that's when I thought I'm pivoting. I'm doing something else. Yeah, amazing. Um, based on the advice you've got from experts who have helped you with your mental health. Um, is it something that you'll have for the rest of your life? Will it ever, ever go? Will it just pop up now and then? Uh, I think it's more, it'll more pop up now and then it might be a noise or it might just be something that I, that I end up, you know, watching on, on television, let's say. Um, so, Sometimes I have to be a bit mindful of what I watch. Of course, yeah. Uh, but it doesn't mean to say that I can't watch yeah. anything. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, I, I, I don't just watch every single police show that's that's going because that yeah. just sometimes can bring things back. Um, yeah. Mm. And, you know, how did it affect, you know, your partner? Because, you know, I know, you know, having a partner, having a, you know, it can affect them. I think a lot of people... You know, think about the police officer, which rightly so, but also the kind of negativity and the, the things that you can bring to your partner in a relationship. Yeah. Did that yeah. affect the relationship at all? Or um, uh, we're all, we're always been very open and honest about things. Yeah. And when I said, "Look, I'm I'm just not right," and uh, I said, "I don't think I want to go back mm. because I felt because I felt horrible." Yeah. And I felt, I felt like I'd, some of it ended up happening that didn't feel like me mm. and would end up causing more issues. Mm. Um, and uh, my partner just said, look, I support you. Mm. You've got to do what's right. got to do what's right for you. Um, yeah. Because she said, I'm not, I'm not going to force you back to do something just because, uh, just because you're in the police. You got to do what's got to do what's right for you. I love that. I, I, so the reason I love that, I love that I have the supportive element. You wouldn't believe 
I mean, I'll say a lot, but I'll say there's there's, a, there's a, quite a few people out there who we've spoke to who are going through a situation in the job, whether that's mental health, just not dis, you know hating the job or whatever it may be. They, they don't want to be there. And their concern is that they're... Oh, sorry. <laughs> right? Is that their um, partner, wife or husband, doesn't want them to leave. Yeah. And and I hear that and I'm thinking, like, you're in pain. You're in a you're in a difficult situation right now. You are, you know, you don't want to be in, in that environment and you're staying in there because your partner doesn't want you to leave. I think that's so I, I think that you give that enough time that you're gonna build up resentment within that relationship. Yeah. And based on just hearing on your story right now, and I've always said this before. But anything that costs you your mental health is far more expensive. And what's not to say in, in that example where your partner doesn't want you to leave the job, even though you're going through a real difficult time in your headspace and everything, that that starts to accumulate. And then eventually, years down the line, you end up splitting because you can't show up and yeah. be the, the dad or the mum or the partner you're supposed to be yeah. because the police has ruined you. So um, I, I love hearing that, Gareth, because... Yeah. Honestly, there's a lot of people out there who are like, oh, I can't leave because, you know, the the the, the, the missus or, or the, the husband won't agree. I'm like, fuck's sake, like, grab your balls. You're in a state, you're negative, you're, you don't want to be in there. Mm. What kind of partner can you show up and be when you're not 100%? Exactly, exactly. And um, I just said, look, I'm not going to stay doing something for the next 20 plus years that... I don't enjoy anymore and just being completely miserable. Mm. And yeah, that's, uh, and that's where, uh, yeah, uh, she was supportive, uh, is supportive. Um, and it, it's, yeah, it really did work for us. Nice. You know, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I was worried about coming away because yeah. finances, salary, da, 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 da. Yeah. But I just thought, yeah. I couldn't see myself staying. Yeah. No, I, I completely get it. I completely if I get had, it. And if I'd forced myself to stay, I would be loathing every minute. Mm. Yeah. Completely like, I miss, I'm, there's a life me being missed. Based on what you've been through with your mental health and, you know, the thought of it popping up now and then for the rest of your life due to what you've experienced, um, if I, you know, if you had like a reset button, would you, <laughs> and, and you knew that this was going to come in your life again, would you leave the job earlier before that it came? I mean, still have years in the job, but before it started to really affect you, would you, cause I know it's hindsight bias, like yeah. you can't, you can't know when it's going to come. No, but no. And I think I should have dealt with it about eight months earlier. Yeah. 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 Okay. Not, makes sense. not not kidding myself that I'd be okay. Be okay. Just a bit yeah. tired. Just yeah. a bit weary. Um, I should have taken a bit more time and spoken with other people. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, you joined Shift Success in 2019. You initially had a, a, a an idea before you pivoted, which is completely fine. And now, you are the founder of Forever Home Dog Training. Uh, do you want to let everyone know what you do within that business? Yeah. So Forever Home Dog Training, uh, we are a uh, well, dog training company that uh, delivers um, uh, bespoke dog training for uh, for individual clients that are experiencing behavioral issues with a rescue dog or a reactive dog. Um, that is our That is our main niche. And we do offer other dog training services as well. Amazing. And, you know, for those who don't know, you joined Shift Success with no previous business experience whatsoever. No. You know, you never been, business, been in business before. And no. also you, you wasn't a dog trainer before in the job either. And no. you basically learned how you went along, which is something we recommend. Um, with regards to, you know, the business itself, um, what kind of common problems do you think that come up in, in, in your business in terms of your clients? So like the problems you solve? Yeah. So we get the things such as, you know, dog not walking nicely on the lead, lunges at things can be quite barky, as you just don't mind. Um, um, 
separation anxiety tends to be a big one as well. Uh, and we get we get the puppy issues, and then we get the older dog issues as well. Yeah. Um, and a lot, of, yeah, I deal with a lot of rescue dogs. Amazing, amazing stuff. And obviously, you've built a community as well. You've obviously you're creating content. I'm seeing you doing your lives and stuff. Um, and you know, I'm gonna say it how it is, but you are smashing it when it comes to your your sales, right? I think your January numbers are like seven thousand pound which is absolutely yeah. incredible. How does that make you feel? I know, you know, we'll go on to, you know, how you feel compared to like your headspace, but yeah. from what you was paying paid in the job to now making, you know, 7,000 pounds and very high profit margins because it's a service-based business. Mm. How do you feel like, because it's a big jump. It's a massive jump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Um, and it's great. Yeah. Um, when, uh, and it becomes it becomes almost uh, a <laughs> a good obsession. Yeah. Like yeah. Um, because I was very much you just get that one ping a month of so much has landed and now it's almost every day. Mm. Just get brr, on your phone, brr, on your yeah. phone, brr, <laughs> on your phone. It's great. Um and I knew with my business mm -hmm. that uh you know, having a particular niche is brilliant yeah. because I get the rescue dogs. I get the reactive dogs. That is what I love dealing with. Uh, but then having the lower ticket ones, if you like, where it's the group classes, it's the puppies and things like that. I love doing that mm. because that's the, that's the, 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 the people stepping the foot in. Yeah. And they're on that kind of journey with me. If yeah. You like. Um, so yeah, get, getting that is, uh, yeah, it, it's brilliant because it's like, I've worked for that. I can see what I'm doing is now, is now making money. That, that idea I had when I was initially off work of thinking, right, I've got an idea for the business. Um, right. How do I go about it? Yeah. And you know, when I, when it first came into my head, 2020, uh, 2021, um, of oh, right. So I'll, do, I'll start doing one to ones. Yeah. Because I like doing that. I like going out, seeing people, and seeing the dogs. Um, I still do that. Yeah. But now, instead of it being just like down the road. Yeah. I've now got clients in Liverpool, uh, in Preston, in Lancashire, mm -hmm. um, and they've come from a word of mouth, Google, my website, and being referred to from other professionals. Amazing. Um, and some of these professionals I've never met. Mm. Uh, really as good, well really so good reputation I, I absolutely i absolutely love that and with the behavioral side of things i tend to get i'm pushing on i'm pushing on an open door with yeah. people because they are ready to buy yeah because they just need that they need this problem solving yeah and um you know using this the, the the hard skills the soft skills you get from being you know in the place of talking with people listening to their issues you get people that go Oh, it sounds really embarrassing, but I said, like, no, no, you don't need to be embarrassed. Yeah, yeah, you do not need to be embarrassed. Love that, great. You know, uh, and I always say to people, look, you don't get white hairs like this from doing an easy job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. So, uh, and then a lot of people love the fact that you are an ex service of some kind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they go, oh, because I I get a lot of shift workers. Yep. And they go, oh, I can't always do this in so work shifts. It's like, look, I get it, I get yep. it. I'm not going to ask you to book in a session when you've just done a stretch of nights. Yeah. It's going to be absolutely knackered. And they go, oh. so it, yeah, it's having that empathy. It's knowing how to speak with different people. Mm. And yeah, having that, having the idea of starting off a block of sessions or a particular theme of doing something and then being able to write it down, structure it, and then go, right, I'm going to go and sell it now. Mm. Um, is brilliant yeah. um, and the, the business has just grown and grown so like I said I've gone from a handful of occasional once or twice a week one-to-ones to like three sometimes four one-to-ones in a day and then group classes uh, so it's, it's just become a really a really busy business I love that amazing stuff and, and you know despite your challenges with mental health you've made a success of yourself and you know, I know people have different varying degrees of mental health, um, but you didn't 
you know, it, it could be quite easy to submit to mental health challenges based on how someone's feeling. Mm. Um, I've been there. And what was it that pushed you, despite your mental health challenges, to go, I'm going to do this anyway, despite them? You know, what was that thing for you? For, for me, looking back, it was, well, what's the alternative? Yeah. Like, that yeah. was it. That was it for me. It's two options. For me, it was fighting for me mm. and my family's future. Mm. Love that. Um, so I, I've never I've never liked to be considered lazy. Mm. Um, I've always wanted to think effort that I've done, I've always wanted to be off my own back. Mm. Um, yes, and you know, getting ideas from other people yep. is you know, it is great because that's helped me. Yeah, model success, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. modeling success. Um, and the success for me now is developing other collaborations mm -hmm. as well. So, um, and for me, I still see myself as a new business. Mm. Yeah, of course. I know, yeah. I, I know in the grand, grand scheme of things, still, I still, I still am. Of course, yeah, uh, yeah. But when I kind of like reach out to people uh, and they go, yeah, I've been following you for a while now. Why have you <laughs> reached out to them? And it's like, because I still see myself as quite infant in yeah. in this, and do you want to do you want to speak to me? You yeah. know, it's just this, uh, you know, almost small company. Mm. Um. Uh. So that for me is like, oh right, yeah. I'm, uh, you know what? I'm I'm not doing too bad. <laughs> yeah, it's like a positive feedback, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And yeah. that's that's a great progression because a lot of people. I said this the other day on we had a we had a masterclass in uh, fact last night. But when you're starting a business, it's like, you know, you want things fast, right? You want to, you want, you want money fast. You want this fast. You want customers fast. You want all that fast. And I get it. That's a good thing. I, I call it ag aggressive uh, patience where, you know, you've got to be aggressive with the work you're doing and putting stuff out there, et cetera, but also be patient with your results because they will come with your consistent effort. Yeah. But looking in hindsight, like, you know, you're not even in year, you know, six yet, five yet, you know, when you look back in hindsight, when you're at year five and you've got that hundred K business, you look back to year one and go, yeah, it was a very small amount of time in the grand scheme of things. I mean, when I look back to 2004, when I started, I like, yeah, all that trouble, like of feeling like I wasn't worth it. Yeah. Was yeah. such a small fraction of my business career. And I think people need to have that long-term thinking when it comes to the success and he, and the funny thing is when you start thinking long-term it actually comes a lot quicker because yeah. you're not you're not focusing on the present so much and yeah. actually putting in the the seeds so to speak yeah for the future uh, absolutely and i always knew that business would be a slow a, a slow progression yeah um just just because it's how it is. It takes a yeah. while for your for your name to get out there, and you do need to you do need to be consistent with yeah. how you give your message, with how you're putting yourself out there. Um, and it yeah, it does take time. Yeah, got to show up. Yeah, yeah. and there's been, there's been days where, uh, or sometimes weeks where there's been no new emails, there's been no follow ups, and you're like, yeah. is this is this business going to work? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it just has a flurry over over a couple of days of where you, it's like, oh blimey, it's not stopped. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, you know, e even today, I've had two people booking for two one to ones separately, yeah. um, and that is just through a, a few messages online. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is, and previously that would have been, you know, me doing a, quite a lot of talking with them. Yeah. Um, but. I've now got to the point of where I can find out what I need through a short amount of messages. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, and I do, I do zoom and I do phone calls and, and things like that. Uh, but I try to keep people hot with the medium in which they like to contact him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that, that's important because if you, if you can focus on the wrong tools or the software or, you know, the wrong way to actually your customers reach out to you or vice versa. Yeah you're missing the mark and what, what you said there as all resonates with a story that i've told before about the bamboo tree analogy it's like yes we see people smashing a year six months etc but business is a long game and 
you know, think about the bamboo trial analogies that you, you plant the bamboo seed and it doesn't break the surface for a very, very long time. And this is, you know, kind of tying it in, but as soon as it breaks the surface, it takes off six feet tall in a matter of weeks. And I think the people, what they can't see is all the learning, the, you know, the mis little mistakes they're making, the oh. speaking to customers, the, yeah. the, the, the nose, the rejection, that's all building up under the surface, meaning yeah. you can't see results yet. But as yeah. soon as you start getting results and it pops through, that's when it starts to take off because it starts to work, right? That's when you figure yeah. things out. Yeah. And I, you know, uh, we are we're human, aren't we? And yep. we make mistakes, which I think is something that <laughs> coming back to the police. Yeah. You're not allowed to make mistakes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You, you have got to be this thing that's constantly plugged in. Mm. Um, you can be no faltering in anything that you do. And yeah, I make mistakes every day. It's like, oh, I should have contacted that person. Yep. I didn't do that. Um, or even last night I was doing I was doing group classes and I got two names the wrong way around. <laughs> yeah, so, I've, been, I've done it before. I called one of our Mar members. Margaret Frank. Sue. Sue was Margaret, and they're going, oh, actually, I'm Margaret, I'm Sue. And I go, long day, memory like I said. I'm sorry. <laughs> but that is because that's my that is my personality, not intentionally forgetful, but I can yeah. just go, I can go, oh, I'm really sorry. Yeah. Um, it's on it, that's that's on me. Um I'd laugh it off. Yeah. Um, and they don't draw anything like they like it because it, you, you're seen as human, yeah. you know. And um, I always say to people that I work with, look, I am what you get. I'm yeah. not, you know, I don't come dressed up as, you know, tweed jacket and, you know, yeah. uh, you know, fancy shoes or anything like that. If it's a hot day, shorts and T-shirt, if it's chucking it down, well, I've, you know, typical northerner, I've got my big coat. Yeah. Um, and people like that and i'm i'm always learning in the background well how uh, does that make you feel like you get to be yourself like you just yeah. said there to your clients i am who i am yeah Did you compared to the police obviously you've got to be you know this other person yeah it's a mask yeah I, I, how does that make you feel is it like a i don't know you you get to be yourself now how how does that uh, uh, sometimes you know i feel 10 foot tall mm. You know, um, like yesterday, I was working with with a client. It was our second session, uh, and first time, I wasn't sure if we were going to be good fit mm. because they were a bit distant, a bit off with conversation. Uh, I went around yesterday, and completely different. Oh. We're having a bit of a laugh, a bit, of, a bit of a giggle, and it's nice to be able to do that. Because they're still getting the they're still getting the quality and the training, but what the, what I'm doing is I'm taking away the stress that they're experiencing. Yeah. With the dog. Yeah. And they go, you know, go. I really enjoyed that. I got we did loads. And you're thinking, well, yeah, we've only been out forty minutes, and we've mm. done we've done quite a bit of stuff. Um, and people love that because they're getting that personable service. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Which, which happens anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you've got, I think, how many Google five-star reviews now? Uh, I think we're on about 32. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And that's, that's you know, that's a good sign for youth as well, like feedback, because, you know, when clients leave reviews, it's, it's it's a nice feeling. It's like that positive feedback loop that you're going, yeah, okay, I'm on the right track and I'm making the good moves here. Yeah. Um, how does it feel when you got that first review? It, it felt really good because it's like, oh, the Google's working. And, uh, you know, it, for me, it was more, oh, I've managed to do something with tech and not blow it up. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it felt great. And then it's it was it's been consistent with asking clients to do it. Mm. Uh, and then I'll, I'll get things like rolling reviews from, from clients who will just – had a brilliant session with Gareth today, and, you know, I capture it, I screenshot it, I make sure it's, like, there – <laughs> on yeah. the social media um because for me that is uh, yeah i'm good at what i do mm. it's obviously working for people yeah. um and they're happy to do it that i've not asked them to do that they've just done it off their own backs yeah, yeah. which says to me um yeah I'm, I'm i'm running a good service i love that and you know you a lot of things that come up with a lot of police officers like they're trying to look for a passion like you didn't know you was going to be good at this you didn't know that you know it's that kind of uncertainty and as you start getting feedback in terms of the sales you're making and the the, the positive reviews and they start coming in you know the, the, it might turn into a passion then but i think a lot of people they look for a passion at the beginning which 
is yeah. almost like a, a trap because you don't know what you're passionate about because you've been in the job for so long. Yeah. Um, well, initially, to... when I was looking at ideas, mm. I dismissed doing anything with dogs. Yeah. And this, I, remember, I remember talking with uh, with James and Robin when we, when you used to do the big uh, ideas meetups. Yeah. Um, and I dismissed it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then ended. I mean, obviously, yes, I'm a dog owner, as you've heard from the noise a few yeah. minutes ago. But um, that is why Forever Home Dog Training was created because we've got a rescue staffy. She's yeah. nervous. Yeah. So when she gets really nervous and anxious. Mm she makes those noises yeah um and we had no massive follow-up support once we adopted her yeah um and then the reactive side of things yes i fell into because post lockdown there was just a massive amount of of people coming forward my dog's not been socialized my dog's not had this my dog's not had that so i thought rather than going oh, it's not something i can deal with i'm sorry i thought right let's find out how i can deal with it yeah okay because that was just a strong pivot yeah for and I've trained to be a reactivity specialist. Um, can't show you it, but at the side of where the screen is here, yeah. I've got a stack of books that are all about dog behavior. Yeah. Uh, and I'm studying to be a, a canine behaviorist, yeah. which is a different level from a dog trainer. Yeah. Um, so that's where I see myself going in the future, I love the that. behaviorist side of things. Uh, so it's very specialist. Yeah, I love that. Oh, and talking about the future, Comparing you, because like you said, there's a lot of, you know, cops out there who join the job 35 years. This is where I'm going to stay. How do you feel about your future now compared to that previous thought of I'm going to stay here for 35 years? I don't feel trapped. Mm. 35 years felt very trapping. Mm. Like, all right, oh, I've got this. How many sets? How many days? How many months is that? Yeah. Whilst this is... um well, today's a busy day. Tomorrow's not a busy day. Mm. And then, right, what am I going to do? What am I doing next month? Mm. So, uh, yes, I've got where I'd like to be in a few years. Mm -hmm. So when I first started off, um, sat down in my old office, writing down, so what is it I want? What, what, what to me is a is a dog trainer? And it was having somewhere, as that's a focal point, somewhere where people can come to. And I've now got that. Mm. Uh, last year, I was able to invest in my own training center, uh, which is mine. It's mine all day, every day. I was using um, scout huts and village halls, which are great. Mm. Don't get me wrong. But it just wasn't working for me. Yeah. Um, so now I've got my, my own place. I don't have to justify to, you know, a groundskeeper of, well, can you keep the gates open until 10 o'clock tonight, please, Tony? Um, yeah. Because I've got classes running. Um and I've got so much stuff. Um, I was having to store it in my car. Wow. I was having to keep it in my car because yeah. I just couldn't, I wasn't allowed to keep it at these different venues. Yeah. So now I've got all my stuff uh, at my training center and I can run one-to-ones from there. I can run group classes from there. I've got people that, con you know, that are clients who contact me and go, oh, can I book the space out for an hour? Just so I can let the dogs ever run around. I'm there, but I don't have to do anything. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. and that's combined with your online stuff as well. Yeah. So that isn't a big ticket, mm. but it keeps people coming through the door for yeah. me. Yeah. So for me, that is what I wanted was having a place that is central. Mm. Makes on sense. On top of the online, on top of going out to people, because mm. it's a, it's, no, I know it's not a word, but it's like multi facing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's almost like um, your forever, um, forever home, forever dog home, um, HQ. It's your, yeah. it's, your, it's your HQ, right? Oh, HQ. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so with regards to um, some of the biggest lessons that you've learned in business, do you want to share some of the biggest lessons? I know you've been with us since 2019, but anything that stands out for you where, you know, some of the mentors have said, or maybe the coaches, something that you picked up along the way that, you know, is stuck with you that's helped you perform? Developing your products. Mm having a clear idea of what you can offer yeah, and being realistic with what you can offer initially. Mm. Yeah. I, I knew that I was, when I first started off that I couldn't do uh, a set of group classes, mm -hmm. one to six. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't have the confidence about being online. Yeah. I knew how to do live videos and stuff like that. I, 
which I was forgetting to do. Um, it, I found it easy just to type something up, but not being afraid to branch out mm. and dip your toe. Yeah, and figure things out. Yes. Speak to di- speak to different people. Mm. Uh, be surprised. Uh, and it's not just in dog training. I'm sure it's in loads of other industries where people start off going, "Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm going to speak with people. I'm going to learn from others," and then it becomes very isolated. Yes, and insular. Uh, and it's that is quite a thing within dog training. Mm. Uh, I'm speaking. I speak with two or three other dog trainers locally mm-hmm. because there's more than enough dogs, and there's more than enough business. It's very true. And that's sometimes when people go into business, a common thing that always comes up is that they think, oh, there's not enough opportunity around. And they get this almost like um, limiting belief around a lack of abundance. Yeah. When actually, there's, there's, there's plenty of money to go around for everyone. But also, you don't need millions of customers. You don't even need hundreds of customers. You need a handful every single year or month, depending on what your business is, for you yeah. to have a very successful, profitable business. Yeah. And I think that's something that I think a, a, a people listening is that you don't need everyone, right? You, yeah. you, you can make yourself unique, stand out in a unique way. And Joe uh, Smith said the other day on the podcast, you are you. People are buying from you. And they like you, they've got an affiliation with you rather than someone else they might not want to work exactly. with. Yeah. And I've got some fantastic long term clients. Yeah. And they bang the drum for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you want. People yeah. spreading the good word you're doing. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, with regards to, you know, some police officers listen to this back or, or, or watching this back. And, you know, they might be in a similar situation to where you were in terms of their mental health and how they've been feeling about things and they don't want to really stay in the job for 35 years. Um, they might've tried to apply for different jobs, but you know, the, the qualification criteria, you need this and this and this, and they're just feeling like a bit deflated with the job market. And the other alternative is business. What advice would you give to those cops listening on video, watching a video or listening back on the podcast to make that change? What, what advice would you give them? Don't be dismissive of of outside information. Mm. If there's people that are offering expertise and they're doing it consistently, learn from them. Mm. Lean into what they're offering, whether it be through podcasts, YouTube, uh, Facebook Lives. Um, Because I never thought that I'd go into business. Mm. I just always thought it was, that's someone else who's, who's got a different brain. Yeah, intelligent, academic, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, they know how the stocks work. They know how this works. They know how that works. Yes. Uh, whilst actually, if there's a market, there's a business. Yes. And yeah. it is figuring out what works for you. Yeah. Um. Again, a lot of a lot of service personnel, police can be. Oh no, I'm not doing that. That's you know. I, I'm keeping with that and I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to do, I'll just do more overtime. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I was like that. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm only, I'm only doing the one football match. Yeah. That's a seven o'clock start that then turns into doing the early nighttime economy when you're finishing at eight o'clock in the evening. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, not, it's not good. I, I don't have that. <laughs> no. And, and that's, you know, I think again, if you work out the numbers, I'm very analytical with this is that when you work overtime, no, if you're in a bad state mentally, that's obviously going to take its toll more because you're putting yourself in the same environment that's making you feel that way. Yeah. But also like financially, it's like, well, you're going to get taxed more. Like if you hit that 50 grand bracket over the year, you're taxed at 40%. I'm thinking you, you're doing more work for less payoff and you're already underpaid. Yeah. And it's like when you start a business, you can be making what you're making, you know, seven grand a month or, or more and you have a limited company, well, you're yeah. going to, having much more better tax benefits and oh, yeah. getting more money. Yeah. Um, does that make sense to you? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and like I said earlier on, that's money that I've that I've earned because of how the business has, has gone. Mm. You know, I started off probably offering sort of charging way under what I should. You was, I can remember. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and now um, I'm in the market where I can start going, you know what, I'm going to dabble a bit higher, a bit higher, a bit yep. higher. And yeah, seven seven grand a month last month. Uh we're on six, six, seven. Mm. Uh so far this month. I'm just waiting for another couple just to ping yep. over. And then it'll be at seven again. 
Um, so, you know, two seven grand months, even last year, I, I wouldn't have thought that. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, and now that means I can I can do a bit more investing. I can now divert some of those funds into uh, into my own pension. That's right. Uh, you've started that actually. You've yeah, recently yeah, you've yeah. Money from your SIP into your pension. Into yeah, because uh, I, I'm now the, the the business money. It, you know, it, it it's investing itself. Yep. In terms of the property that I've got. Yeah. Um, you know, buying bits of equipment because it's always something new to be adding. Mm. So I'm always getting different types of inquiries, mm. and some, some some of them are in my wheelhouse or interest. Yeah. And I go, no, I'm sorry, I don't offer that. But yep. I'm not worrying now going, oh, should I be offering that so I can appeal to everyone? Yeah. Um, Because some things I just haven't got the size. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're not doing big amount, big amounts of agility and stuff like that. It doesn't interest me. Mm. Yeah. Uh, people have asked and I go, yeah. And that's the thing. It's like you just doing what you want to do. I think in business, it's important as well to like, you know, you own your business and I think I shared a story before, like of a sports bar when, you know, the, uh, a, 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 a person who came into the pub or the sports bar basically says, oh, you should have uh, this kind of food. So basically they changed the menu and had that kind of food, right? I think it was like seafood. And then another person came and says, oh, you should have a, a pool hall in, in your, in your, um, in your bar. And they go, okay, we'll put a pool bar. And then someone else says, oh, you should put some karaoke in and people put par- karaoke in. And what, and what happened is that business changed so much by coming away from its niche that it was no longer a business and it went out of business where the other, the other bar down the road stuck to its values. When people said, we want this food, they go, oh no, we're going to do this because this is what we want to focus on. And this is what, you know, the niche that we've picked. The other person said no to the snooker table or the pool table and, and the the music, the karaoke, Mm -hmm. and that business is thriving. So I think it's important to get feedback from customers or to get some market research out there, but don't just change off like one or two people saying certain things. You've got to stick to your kind of values and guns in business and where you see your vision going. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And so we're talking about the police pension, the the big thing that keeps many people in the job for a long time. Obviously you had your challenges with with the mental health, Mm. but what went through your mind? I I know you now invest and you know, you that, which is amazing, but when you were faced with that situation of coming out the job and worried about the pension, how did you overcome that? Well, I already knew the pension was crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it was like the week had the week had signed on. Yeah. It, the week it was announced that it was changing from final salary to career average. Mm. And then I was like, mm, right. It's only going to be dabbled with another two or three times. During mm. my life, so and there was um, the pension challenge as well, which uh, the Fed tried to dismiss off, uh, which is another conversation for another time. Uh, when I was part of that pension challenge, I thought that's my money. Yeah, of course, my money. I bloody work for, mm. uh, and it doesn't matter if I can't get access to it for another thirty-five or forty years. You're dabbling, and it means I've got to work post-retirement. Mm. No. Yeah. So I'd already made that decision that it's not it's nice to have mm. if I can find another way of making my money work better for me, mm. then I'm gonna do it. Love that. Love it. It makes sense. Um Gareth, where can people get in touch with you? Like where can they reach out to you, stalk you, check you out? So um I'm everywhere pretty much. So <laughs> uh, Facebook is probably the better one because that's where everything goes, and that is foreverhomedogtraining.com. Uh, it's also linked in with my personal profile, so that's Gareth Dickinson. Uh, and you'll see a picture of me uh, with my Labrador pup, Lyra. Uh, and the website is www.foreverhomedogtraining.com. Uh, and people can reach out. They can direct message me. Um, there's also the WhatsApp links there as well. Um, so, yeah, uh, quite easy to get in contact with. Awesome. Amazing. And the last question we ask everyone on the show is what does entrepreneurship mean to you personally? Freedom. Mm. Love I can make the choice of, am I going to have a short day or am I going to have a long day? Mm. I'm not, oh, well, you know, you're doing a, you're doing a seven five today and we might have to keep you on. Mm. No. Amazing. Gareth, you've been an absolute superstar. 
on behalf of myself and the team, we're incredibly proud of you to see where you were. Yeah. Uh, I know we had a few conversations when you were going through that dark time yeah. and uh, to see where you are now, mate, is is truly inspirational. I genuinely mean that from the bottom of my heart. Okay. Um, you've come through your own personal challenges, your battles, you, you know, your insecurities of starting a business, mm -hmm. pivoting, pivoting an idea to now, you know, thriving in business is absolutely exceptional. So yeah. we're extremely proud of you, but hopefully you're proud of yourself as well because you I are am. superstar. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the support and, you know, uh, isn't forgotten. Um, so, yeah, thank you. No problem at all, mate. We're always here. So, guys, hopefully you got value from that. Hopefully you, um, you know, you, you've got inspired from that and got some knowledge bombs from it as well. Uh, this will be on the podcast later uh, this week um, and also it'll be up on YouTube as well. So if you do want to watch it back and, of course, I will leave it in the Facebook group as well. Gareth, thanks again. Absolutely exceptional. And uh, I can't wait to see you thrive in the future. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me.